China. Group project by group number one for business 380. Our agenda will be as follows, starting off with the Hofstede dimensions, political and legal, currency and exchange, trade FDI and one product presentation, finalized by a, a two more project presentations. The Hofstede Dimensions take a look at a culture and break it down into six different areas. Starting with the power distance, the country's individualism versus collectivism, the country's masculinity versus femininity, the country's uncertainty avoidance, the country's long-term versus short-term orientation, and a country's indulgence versus their restraint. In this section, we'll take a look at the overview of how China compares very specifically to the United States and look at these similarities and differences. Overall, China and the United States differ greatly on the Hofstede dimensions. However, there is one area where they have a very close match. That area is masculinity. This means that both societies are driven by competition, success, and achievements. This area is the only common ground on the Hofstede dimensions for China and the United States. The next area that there's a difference is power distance. In China, there are very few people who control power, and the gap between those in power and the rest of the people is very large, unlike in the United States. Where there still is a power gap, it is, however, just not as large as in China. Individualism is another area where China ranks very low, unlike the United States, and they view the overall good of the community as more important and are sometimes willing to give up certain individual rights for the greater good. Long-term orientation is a second, is a third area where China is in contrast to the United States and they tend to take a more pragmatic approach about the future. Indulgence is a final area where there is a difference between the United States and China where <clears throat> indulgence is the extent to which people try to control their desires and impulses based on the way they were raised. China has a tendency to be pessimistic and they do not give themselves much leisure time and control gratification of their desires. That there's three main hot topics that are going on. One is the Tiananmen Square protest. The picture up in the right hand corner shows a man standing in front of a column of tanks. This was taken in 1989 when this man was standing up for Chinese rights and he ended up being shot dead uh, along with several other college students and protesters. For 30 years, the Chinese authorities have continued to try and erase this event from the Chinese history, and the people are now finding out about it, and they're really upset. Um, China is also issuing U.S. travel warnings. And China's warned its citizens to fully assess the risks of traveling in the United States because they're claiming that there's been recent shootings as a tension between the superpower rise. They're also saying that the U.S. law enforcement agencies have been harassing the citizens. Another hot topic in um, the po political world of China is this relationship between China and Russia's leaders. They're now calling themselves, quote unquote, best friends. Moving on to the next slide, which is legal issues in the Chinese market. When entering a product or anything into the Chinese market, there's several things to take in consideration, and we've touched on just a few of them. One really hard hoop to jump through is often registration and certifications. Lots of things need to be approved by Chinese authorities, and there's several processes and documents and paperwork that are really hard to jump through. Another major legal issue that I want to point out is 
the property, the intellectual property protection in China. Oftentimes, lots of things, even though they may be patent and trademarked or copyrighted, um, they still get copied in China, and they don't enforce the law of infringement very often. There's also important things to keep in consideration when it comes to local and import tax. You're going to get taxed heavily in China, um, it depending it depending on what it is, but also if you have to import something for your item or product that you're selling, you'll be taxed on that as well. Economic and currency exchange. One of the most important things that we found out about investing in any country is the economic strength that the country uh, has. A couple of things we'd like to focus on in this presentation that gives us a good snapshot of the country's economic health are number one, inflation, number two, interest rates, and number three, current debts and that you know debt to cash flow red, uh, ratio. Inflation uh, is a, a good uh, indicator and uh, it uh, indicates also in the rise of price of goods and services over any you know given period of time. If the inflation is too high, everything costs too much and uh, ties up money that could be used basically uh, for investing in any business. Um, so the inflation rate is a, of any country is usually a key indicator and is kind of used as an international benchmark. Uh, if you look at the inflation rate of the United States up there in the, the top um, and the inflation rate of China, you'll see very similar patterns with uh, the United States clocking in at just a little over 2.25% in the United States. And about the same in China with uh, projections going out to 2024 with it maybe rising as high as 3%. So um, this is actually pretty good for any uh, established industrialized uh, uh, country. Now, if you look at the corresponding uh, inflation rates in the Asia Pacific area in 2017, you see some, uh, some pretty interesting indicators. Uh, so the inflation rate in China in 2017 was about 1.56%, but uh, Sri Lanka clocked in at 6.54%. So you kind of see a, a, a difference there. Now take a look at this next slide because it shows the lending rates uh, that are available at the same period of time in, in uh, 2017. It looks almost like a mirror image. Uh, China uh, interest uh, lending interest rate was 4.35%, which is very reasonable. Mongolia, on the other hand, had an interest uh, rate, uh, lending inter interest rate of 20%, which uh, you know uh, that pretty much uh, ties up the, the the amount of money that uh, is going to be um, lent out to businesses. Uh, the lower the uh, lending interest rate, the more apt the business will take out loans and explore uh, entrepreneurship possibilities. Okay, now the debt to uh, the national debt of any uh, industrial and emerging country in the United States. This this, this uh, is a nice little slide here. It uh, it shows the debt to GPD ratio. Now, uh, in any emerging country, you want to have about sixty percent. That's kind of the, the benchmark that was established, oh, probably about 20 years ago, uh, 10, 20 years ago, of about 60% for an emerging uh, nation. If they get anywhere uh, below 40%, it ca it's cause for alarm. Uh, now, of course, as uh, the country becomes more wealthier, that GDP ratio can climb to a higher rate. Um, for instance, Japan now has the highest public debt ratio with a GDP of 237%. Uh, the United States is very conservative at about 105%, and that's good for a highly developed country. China, on the other hand, is right about where it should be at a solid 50%. Now this slide shows the growth stability of the GDP in China. Now we see that, that there was some really wide, you know, up and down uh, as uh, the 2000s rolled in. And then of course, uh, 2008, 2009, uh, China had that uh, crash and a little bit of a rebound. 
but you know, since then it has uh, slowly evened out. Uh, analysts were expecting a little bit of a maybe a dip or so uh, in quarter 19, but in uh, April of 2019 they released that uh, China held steady at a 6.4% 6 6 uh, very, very stabilized 6.4%. So that, that is a good indicator on the stability of the GDP of China. Now let's take a look at the currency reserves that um, are in China and also how the kind of benchmark against other um, uh, countries. Okay, so this graph shows a, a comparison of, of these emerging markets, these, these emerging countries um, between 2007 and 2011. The lighter bar uh, indicates uh, 2007 growth and uh, we see that uh, Singapore had 179 billion US dollars um, uh, and then they grew in 2011 to 249 billion dollars. Now here's the thing uh, every every country did in fact grow from 2011 to 2000 uh, from 2007 to 2011 but take a look at that uh, China took a huge leap in growth showing great industrial strength and a large amount of exports going out okay and a lot of money coming in the country so the money was staying in the country and very little exports coming in and as a result very little money going out as a payment for those, those goods so they are in a very solid cash uh, reserve Um, for FDI and trade agreements, China was ranked the world's second largest uh, FDI recipient. After the United States and before Hong Kong, the country's economy was ranked the second most attractive to multinational com companies for 2017 to 2019, only behind the United States. With steady growth for several years, FDI inflows continued to increase between 2016 and 2017 from 133 billion to 136 billion US dollars. China is, a, is growing very fast and is very invested in. However, China does have a lot of restrictions. They require foreign investment to have joint ventures with their local firms. So basically, if you want to um, start a business in China, you have to be a joint venture with a Chinese business. They don't let you just come there and start your own business that you own solely if you're not a citizen. China does have restrictions on investment in vehicles, however, they recently lifted a lot of restrictions in which automotive industry or in the automotive industry for new energy vehicles, which by 2020 they will lift the equity gap to 51% for commercial vehicles, and by 2022 they'll lift the cap for passenger vehicles as well. So this is a breakthrough in China for um, new energy vehicles like electric cars and things like that. They're allowing people that are coming into the country um, to start a business to have the major equity share in their company. So when they be a joint venture with the Chinese company, they don't have to give up the majority of the company. Um, and um, like it says in here, China does appear to have a booming economy. It's a so it's a great company to or country to invest in. It's the second highest uh, FDI recipient. However, they do have some issues being a communist country, uh, com ah, country very large and controlling government. Um, they do have a lot of restrictions for foreigners, um, but for vehicles, um, they do seem like a pretty good com uh, country to invest in. And so for my product idea, I had electric cars. Um, the electric car industry is growing really fast in China and um, that Chinese government is really pushing to uh, use electric cars and to have them. The water purifying industry accounted $4 billion in 2017 and has projections of $12 billion by 2023. This growth is driven by China's growing awareness of its population crisis and increase in the awareness of health standards. This leads to an increase in the amount of demand for water purifiers. China has undergone large efforts to reduce pollution and improve air and water quality over the past few years, 
However, the supply of clean, drinkable water is still scarce. The majority of the population is, expect is exposed to harmful bacteria in their water supply. Water purifiers for home use are becoming increasingly popular, however, there is still an underserved market to be found here. Not many competitors are uh, producing personal water purifiers that can be taken on the go. This market is appealing because it applies to two major factors that are pushing profitability of water purifiers in China. The need for clean, the need for clean drinkable water and the desire to reduce waste. A personal water purifier would allow customers to have clean water wherever they go, while also reducing the use of plastic bottles. China's limited clean water supply calls for both industrial and commercial water purifiers. There is currently a large market for industrial water purifiers that is being met by our, our competitors. However, there is also a smaller amount of commercial water purifiers on the market. These water purifiers are not very affordable or reusable, or they're not portable. This, this opens a opportunity in the market for us to cre uh, produce a portable, reusable, and affordable water purifier for everyday personal use. There are very low entry barriers to the water purifier market. This market is underdeveloped, leading to not many entry barriers being placed on products like water purifiers. Profit margins are very high since the population is willing to pay higher prices to gain access to clean water. This has driven the market to grow and has allowed for an opening for more affordable and smaller water purifiers. The limited competition would give us a temporary advantage and an opportunity to submit ourselves as the known brand for portable water purifiers. Brand awareness plays a large role in the purifier industry in China. Since China's population places a high value on their purifiers for both air and water, since because of the increase in uh, pollution. The next product idea we have is to create a personal air filter that can be used for everyday use and that can be uh, that's easily portable and easily movable. That's lightweight and allows for people to bring it with them wherever they go, or allows them to easily move it with them from work desk to work desk or room to room. The air purifier market in China accounts for $2 billion in 2017 and has projected growth to reach $4.3 billion in 2023. This growth is pushed by an increased level of air, air pollution caused by constant construction activities and an increase in population. Demand is rising for air purifiers and filters as more demand comes from the commercial sector. This demand is driven by the increased awareness of harmful bacteria in the air in China. China has experienced a rapid growth in population in the past several years. This rapid growth continues every day, even today. With increased population, cities have grown rapidly, resulting in rapid population, which is leading to an air crisis in China. The air quality in China has gotten so bad that there are days where citizens must stay indoors or risk health problems from the dense air pollution covering the cities. There is not currently a lot of competition in the market for air purifiers. This is true for both industrial and commercial. The commercial air filter industry is underserved and the main products on the market currently are large fan-like designs that, that are meant to remain stationary. There is not a lot of competitors who are creating personal air filters that are, port that are small enough to be portable or easily moved. Small, more portable filters are needed for consumers to bring with them when they are on the go. Similarly, a smaller, easy-to-move filter is more convenient because it allows customers to bring it with them easily when they go from room to room. AirTamer is our main competitor who would be selling similar products. However, their products, along with the other competition, are all, uh, all, all have high prices. This makes them difficult for the majority of the population to afford. We can compete in this market by offering a more affordable product targeted at the average person living in the city. 
The main barriers to entry for this industry are the costs of inputs such as steel, aluminum, and electricity. These components are needed to develop the product and produce air filters. There are high tariffs currently placed on these components, leading to an increased cost of production when produced locally in China. Production outside of China might be less costly since the cost of importing a finished air filter is less than importing the materials needed to create one. However, brand awareness plays a large role in this market, and producing locally would help increase brand awareness and help cement us as the known brand for personal air filters. Strategic placing is very important if we are to enter this industry. In conclusion, um, our team feels that China presents an excellent investment opportunity for our company. The company is stable with inflation at a rate that mirrors almost mirrors the United States and an interest rate that is very conducive to investors. Our products can be sold to the wide social and economic classes that reside in China. Our electric cars will help reduce the problem of smog in some of the more populated areas. And the water purifiers that we offer will help in some of the smaller rural areas and also in the heavily populated poorer cities uh, you know, areas. The air filters will help reduce the impurities in the indoor dwelling areas, uh, thus helping reduce some of the respiratory disease that we find uh, in China. We'd like to thank you for your attention during our presentation and uh, our group uh, would like to invite you out to the lobby for some refreshments and some uh, networking abilities.